All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, City of Clear Lake Shores, City Council regular meeting, August 3rd, 2021, at 6.30 p.m. Uh, call to order, and we have a quorum. All council members are present. Item number two, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and America and Texas flag. Item number three is public hearing uh, for 922 Elm, consider, considered an unsafe structure and demolition. Anybody here would like to speak on behalf of 922 Elm is welcome to. No, public hearing open at 631. I'm sorry, a little more than a year and a half ago, uh, 922 Elm was presented to council uh, for a demolition order because of unsafe structure. Um, that council did vote to tear the house down. At the time, there were family members still living in the property, and the owner listed under CAD, or with the appraisal district, had died. Um, I visited with the family, asked them to provide me with some, part of some sort of proof that they were willed the property or the property was given to them by the late owner. Um, after a few months, they never came forward with any kind of evidence. I did then order a writ of entry through the municipal court and gave the uh, property a thorough examination and found numerous uh, problems with the home, may ba basically making it unlivable. Um, after a few, uh, another month or so, uh, the gas was turned off by uh, Centerpoint Energy because of a leaky gas line. I then talked to the family again, asked them to provide me more proof and to please repair the gas line. Uh, the answer they gave me is they will try. Uh, soon after COVID hit and pretty much shut down everything, and then um, recently the house was vacated about two months ago, and I thought it a good opportunity to, to put it forth to council to vote on it again because uh, it had been well, well over a year. That's where it sits. Yes, we did send notification to the owners. We sent it to the family. We didn't have to um, because the only person listed was uh, Vern Johnson, who was deceased. Uh, we also tried to contact the mortgage company, and I believe our attorney spoke with them. Yes, it was. Um, and that's how it sat and is still today. It's still, it's still unlivable. It uh, is in dire need of being uh, demoed. 
I'd just like to add that uh, the people that were living there have all been relocated to other areas, so uh, they were not displaced in this action, and that was something that we were sensitive to, but also their safety and um, allowing them to make appropriate arrangements to relocate elsewhere. So I believe the daughter and the mother went uh, north to Houston and the son uh, south to Galveston. That's all I needed to add. All right, thank you. Any uh, public uh, portion for this, for the public hearing item number three? Having none, we'll close this at 6.35. We'll go to item number four, reports from council. Councilman Steve Wordis. Nothing to report at this time. Thank you, Mr. Wordis. Councilman Rick Fisher. Nothing to report at this time. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Councilwoman Monica Lede. Nothing to report. Thank you, Ms. Lede. Uh, Councilman Alex Scanlon. Nothing tonight. Thank you, Mr. Scanlon and Councilman Randy Cronister. So the roads and drainage, we had a meeting last week and uh, went over some of the items that were brought back uh, in previous conversation here in City Hall. And uh, Alex redid those, brought them back in front of that committee. They deliberated for a couple of hours over everything, just going over everything, dotting the I's, crossing the T's making sure that that's what that committee wanted to do to bring back to council and uh, I think at this point it's it's going to go to Lauren and then it's going to come to council I think they're ready for that that's good is that it thank you Mr. Cronister uh, a couple comments from my side just a reminder that the second city council meeting is canceled <laughs> for 8 17 for August and also on September 21st and then our meeting is still on for a 9 7 uh, in September and then also uh, coming up in next week or so the uh, school's going back in session so watch out for the parents I mean the kids um, <laughs> they'll be out and about and uh, school buses running around the island and uh, in the city limits um, so I guess the first day is pre-k kindergarten sixth and ninth grade on the 16th and then the rest start on the 17th so just remember that and watch out for everybody Item number five, staff reports, Police Department Chief Keel. Test. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, we're going to report the stats for the month of July. Uh, Clear Lake Shores Police Department uh, conducted 366 tra uh, traffic contacts, zero DWI arrests seven narcotics offenses we took one burglary of a motor vehicle report we had zero frauds <laughs> Ronnie it's time to go home <laughs> <laughs> now I gotta start over anyway no uh, we had zero frauds which I'm kind of proud of uh, it seems like the issues that the uh, Valero have been uh, addressed uh, appropriately. I think their new gas dispensing pumps are uh, somewhat tamper-proof, and uh, we've we've seen a dramatic decrease in those types of calls. Uh, we had four theft calls. We made 19 arrests. Uh, eight, on eight occasions, we assisted another agency. We conducted 72 residential checks and 603 business checks for the month of July. And I just want to touch on uh, 922L. I just have a, a just a side note. Um, Aaron Johnson the, was the son is the son of Vern Johnson, and he has relocated. Uh, he went to the Salvation Army in Galveston, who has assisted him with uh, job training, uh, having a place to stay. Uh, they're working for working with him on housing uh, subsidies. Uh, he has a job, and uh, from what I understand, he's doing really, really well. He works at the San Louis, and uh, he's he's doing really good things, and uh, I'm proud of him. <laughs> it's been kind of a project. Uh, uh, somehow, I seem to have adopted him. But um, anyway, I'll tell you that to tell you this: uh, one of the issues that I had with the, the process with the House on Elm 
uh, was that there were people there and that uh, Kevin and I and, and, and the city manager discussed it. And I just couldn't see, you know, people walking down the street uh, with nowhere to go. Um, and they are taken care of and they're in a place where they, they have a, a place to live. Uh, I'm not real sure how t uh, Tiffany and Kimmy are doing as far as uh, job-wise. Uh, I know there were some struggles there to, for uh, Tiffany to get a job, but Aaron uh, has, has gotten a job, and he reports to me just about every other day uh, with an email and tells me that, uh, that things are going good. And I just wanted everybody to know that uh, he's doing great. Thanks, Chief Keel, and that means a lot. I know you, you know, worked a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff to to make all that happen, and kudos for all that. And do you have any uh, lead-in for the donations you want? Because we've forgotten it a couple of times. Do you want to rec recommend to the city for people to donate to? Yes. Uh, one of the things that was so helpful with Aaron's uh, situation was that I contacted the Salvation Army. I contacted several places, and a lot of them. They just weren't geared for that type of assistance. So uh, I don't know how anybody feels about the Salvation Army and their, their, their donation structure, but I know that in this particular instance, that young man has a place to be. He has hope. And if you could find it in your heart, if you, if you have a, a, a charitable heart, please consider Salvation Army. That's my highlight uh, for, the, for the month. Thank you. Thanks, Chief Gill. All right, next is uh, Building Official Kevin Harrell. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Building report since our last meeting. I've had 15 permits issued. Uh, all 15 were minor construction. Um, I currently have six homes under construction in different states of uh, completion. Uh, commercial, I, I Galveston Bay Brewing Company, both I and the fire marshal have reviewed the plans for a second time. We still have a few issues that need to be addressed. Uh, they are back in the hands of the architect. Hopefully they'll have them back soon, and I can issue them a permit. 419 Oak, the property, as I'd mentioned, our last council meeting has been, is in the process of being bought. Uh, I have spoken with a prospective new owner, and he wants to clean the property completely. Um, they are hoping to close by August 17th. Um, till then, uh, it will have to come back to council for another public hearing for the new owner because that public hearing we had prior to was strictly for Mr. Chernecki. Uh Code enforcement cases, I currently have three cases. One is a junk vehicle, uh, two are high grass and weeds. The junk vehicle has been resolved. That's all I have unless you have questions. Thank you, Mr. Harrell. Next is uh, Clear Lake Shores, Kima Volunteer Fire Department Chief Rob Zuniga. Yep. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Is that working? Okay, um, so for the month of July, we had a uh, total of 54 calls for service, 31 of those being EMS, 23 fire. Um, our average response time was 5 minutes, 11 seconds, and our average turnout time was 1 minute and 28 seconds. 20% uh, of the calls, or a total of 10 of those, were second out or overlapping. Um, we responded to 5 mutual aid calls and we received mutual aid to Kemo or Clear Lake Shores a total of two times in the month of July. Um, this month we have completed our ISO audit and we will receive the outcome and our grading within the next four to six months. The second military vehicle was received this month and now we are just waiting for the upfitting of, uh, we have to get it painted emergency lights and equipment put onto it and then we will have two high water vehicles so for better adequate and a better adequate coverage for both cities so um, that's all I have uh, for the month of July. Any questions? Mm -hmm. 
Thanks, Rob. All right, next is uh, Galveston County Health District, Amy Weber, and she's getting a break from having to do all that work. So good to see you here. Thank you. Um, the stats for the month of July, we had 81 calls in Kima, six in Clear Lake Shores. Uh, we gave away 16 mutual aids, um, and we received six mutual aids. Uh, we have an average response time of five minutes and 36 seconds. Um, I would like to touch base on what he was talking about. Uh, we are seeing a very concerning shortage in our staff, um, and it's mainly due to market rates. Um, we had a study done about three years ago uh, with a company called uh, MAG, and they did a study. Um, currently, our employees are below market value, um, and they are leaving currently. We have 28 openings. Um, so if we have an outbreak with COVID in our staff, I'm concerned about, you know, how the response is going. Myself and my staff are out in the field helping as much as we can. Um, but I will be asking for an increase uh, of $2,183 to help me bring up my guys to, set or to market uh, for next fiscal year. And absolutely uh, understand the whole market value thing. We're having the same problem with divers and stuff. So they're uh, finding other jobs other places. So let us know how we can help in any way. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Next is uh, City Administrator Brent Spear. Uh, good evening, uh, Council, members of the public. Uh, where my report, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, as far as uh, Shell Bottom Park goes, there's some additional calculations to do on the uh, parking lot, and I'll check in with that engineer uh, tomorrow. I have trouble catching up between me being out on vacation and him being out. So uh, follow up with that. As a reminder to anyone in here that has a waterfront lease that has not paid your lease payment, uh, they're now late. Um, we currently have $6,050 in outstanding waterfront lease payments. Uh, didn't bring a full list of names, but uh, it's about 20, 25 people. So uh, you have until uh, the 10-day grace period ends, which is August 17th, 2021. And after that time, uh, council can move forward with revocation proceedings in the, at the September meeting. So if you want, uh, if you're within earshot, or you have friends, or you, it just slipped your mind, please get those payments in so you, you can re retain the access to the water. That you uh, that you enjoy. On do uh, Daniel Drawer Avenue, a highlight there. I did attend the uh, the pre bid meeting, and uh, that was a question and answer session uh, for people that were interested in bidding. That they have a total. I, I think I wrote it in here. Uh, Sixteen or seven, seventeen plans or seventeen plans out at that time. Eight or nine of them are contractors, so they're anticipating uh, competitive bids. Engineer estimate on that project is just uh, a little less than nine hundred thousand dollars. So, uh, as far as timelines go, bid opening is going to be August twelfth at two fifteen, and on August twenty third they'll have the award of the contract at Commissioner's Court, and they will have to have a final legal review before they sign contracts and things like that. So, um, that is moving forward, and that is a that is a big. Uh, community connectivity project that will connect to 518 and it will assist our businesses and it will help our folks uh, as well. So um, keep an eye out for that. As far as public works goes, uh, I do have some estimates for removing dead palms that are located primarily on the west side of the uh, waterfront leases, uh, considered parkland. We did have one come down snap in two so it's a, a dangerous situation and I anticipate contacting one of the vendors tomorrow to move forward with that so you'll see some activity with uh, trees coming down probably have to do it in bits and pieces so trees are going to come down and then eventually our stumps will get ground but um, being um, I'm being uh, cognizant of costs and uh, trying not to uh, exceed anything on our budget, so we should have enough money there and landscaping to get that taken care of. 
not completely, but uh, get a good start and get things safe. As a reminder, uh, keep an eye on the weather. Uh, we've been uh, oppressively hot uh, recently, but um, there's, there's some uh, grumblings uh, over on the other side of the ocean that um, are getting our attention. And then also, uh, just so you're aware, there will be a budget workshop with EDC on August 10th. That will be uh, just prior to their regularly scheduled meeting. It's next Tuesday. Um, and then a combined uh, EDC and uh, City Council workshop that's in line with our strategic plan um, on August 13th. That's a Friday. And that will be at 1 p.m. right here in the clubhouse. So uh, if there are any questions from Council, uh, and when, as I'm developing and working on the budget, please certainly reach out to me. Uh, try to provide you as much information as I can and give you some takeaways. But uh, Council, EDC, and City staff are working hard to get that budget in line, so uh, appreciate your patience. Also, uh, tonight, uh, there is an item missing from the agenda. It would be an appointment to eat the EDC board, and that uh, was unintentional. Uh, I was on vacation and we had discussed it and it slipped by some other folks that were keeping an eye on that agenda. So uh, anticipate that spot being filled at the September meeting. Are there any questions? All right. Thank you, Mr. Spear. Item number six is pub public comments. At this time, any person with city-related business may speak to the city council. My screen just went blank. Topic of discussion must be consistent with any item listed on the agenda. In compliance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, City Council may not deliberate. Comments from the public should be limited to a maximum of three minutes per individual. Anybody like to publicly speak? Ms. Michelski. Might need a microphone. I don't know if they can get that one to work for you. Linda Machowski, 1019 North Shore Drive. I'd like to read a letter from uh, Skipper's Restaurant. It says, to whom it may concern, right after Hurricane Ike, we experienced what we believe was to be fraud by the city of Clear Lake Shores and Jack Friday. We were in the beginning process of rebuilding Skipper's only to find a condemned sticker on our building. When I confronted Jack Friday about this condemned sticker, his immediate response was that I was structurally damaged and I could not rebuild, although I was not structurally damaged at all. I had to spend money out of my own pocket and hire an attorney to fight this matter, which I won. I kept my building intact, and I was able to rebuild and get my permits to do so. If I hadn't hired an attorney, I believe I would have been taken. They would have taken my business and my property like they did with many others during that time. We need to make sure this kind of treatment never happens again. Sincerely, Keeman from Skippers. Also, this is a letter to uh, Randy Weber's office. I am a friend and neighbor of Mrs. Linda Machowski. While visiting with her yesterday, she explained her interest in fraudulent activity in the Kema, Texas area following Hurricane Ike. Mayor Matthew Wiggins and Code Officer Jack Friday conspired to seize property from storm victims by fraudulently condemning said properties via substantially damaged certificates. I am one of those victims, John Melcher. In short, Mr. Friday prohibited me from rebuilding on my property, refusing to issue permits for repair. I was insured for wind and flood damage, and the insurance company set my damage at less than $100,000. As the property value was almost $900,000, this would mean a damage determination of less than 12%. Yet I was ordered to raise the property and rebuild to current code. This sent me into a financial free, for all, free fall. The mortgage company illegally foreclosed and Mayor Wiggins via straw purchaser Judge Mark Foster bought my property from the mortgage company for 20 cents on the dollar. At that point, the SD condemn condemnation evaporated and the building was repaired for less than 20000 Although I'm litigating against these men, no one at the local level will pursue any criminal action against them. They, among others, defrauded me, Texas Windstorm, FEMA, and the NFIP. I'm aware you've been supplied a lot of data, so I'll keep this correspondence brief. 
Please know that I stand ready to tell my complete story to any one of your choosing, should you desire. Best regards, John Melcher, the former owner of Allen Swamp Shack. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Having none, public comments time is complete. Item number seven, old business discussion and possible action may be taken on the following items. Item A is action from the public hearing, which is 922 Elm, unsafe structure and possible demolition. I make a motion that we take down 922L. By take down, you mean demolish? Demolish. Remove the, the structure, the unsafe structure. I'll second. Motion by Ms. Lede, second by Mr. Scanlon. Any discussion? Are there any ramifications to removing the structure from the property? No, all, all, all provided uh, required notices have been provided, uh, and, and sorry, and we have. Uh, um, and and the only thing that needs to happen now is to wait uh, 30 days from council's decision to, before it can be taken down, just to give them a chance to appeal to a uh, municipal or excuse me to district court. TK, in your conversations with the prior residents. Are they aware of what's going on? Uh, that's a kind of a two-part question. Uh, they have been told. I have given them uh, as much as I legally can give them advice on uh, responding and seeking uh, assistance with legal uh, matters that I can't give advice on. Um, the the daughter and mother that vacated several months ago vacated with that information and left the brother at the house uh, and then turned off the utilities and left the brother in a house with no utilities and no, no way to uh, take care of himself. Uh, I don't think that the brother is capable of understanding the situation, although I've given him the same advice. Um, the answer is, do they know? Yes. Do they understand? I don't know that I can answer that. The property is in foreclosure, though, correct? It is. Do, do you have a date, or do we know a date of when the foreclosure is supposed to? It's been no. It is not on the docket. It has been under foreclosure for probably going on two years. Uh, it's a, a foreclosure mill firm out of Dallas that's handling it, and apparently it just stalled out. But they, their council of record has been notified. Do you think it's stalled out due to COVID? Or I guess it's I, just I, speculation. I, I, I can't say. I don't know what happened. There was also another concern with uh, with a federal tax lien that was on that property. So that was a concern that I think Lauren was working right. through. And the federal tax lien turned out to be a state tax lien of about $125. Okay. Had to had to discover okay. that and, right. and had to go through it. Yeah. So who have we gotten in touch with about our intention to possibly demolish this property? As far as mortgage company, as far as lien holders, anybody. Um, the last one that I see here, uh, back in 2006, it was uh, William Woodall uh, became a trustee. Uh, from uh, Vern Johnson, and then it looks like they've got another one here. I don't have a date on it, but um, at least some of the research that I've done, apparently it has now gone to um, another group that is preparing it for foreclosure, from what I understand right now, but it's not in foreclosure. And I think there's some tie-ups in there, uh, just due to the legalities of not having the property willed or you know, any, anything uh, uh, like that. But uh, the contact I got for that was Jeff Lava, who is apparently um, a real estate agent. And from what I understand right now, at least what I'm seeing on here, he is the uh, trustee of that property, uh, trying to uh, get it into uh, 
into a foreclosure has any contact been made with him. I think Mr. Smith's been representing the city on right. We have, we have been contacts. contacting everybody that we can find, and I'm comfortable that we've contacted the, the representatives, uh, the, at least the legal representatives of the mortgage company. So, so if we do go ahead with this, uh, what's the estimate that it would uh, set us back to uh, demolish a property? And then, if we do that, where would that come from? It would, it would just come from uh, probably a rainy day fund and be replenished, but it would be replenished when that property sold because it would be a tax lien right. for the cost of demolishing. So it would just be a, uh, an expenditure out and, and uh, replaced back in. The um, I assume you can recover some reasonable costs in there as well with your uh, demolition bill, so we'll also go after that. The uh, in speaking with uh, another council member that asked this question uh, just earlier today, I, I don't feel like uh, it's it's a huge problem to the city as far as the outlay of cash because uh, empty lots in this city are not empty very long. If they're buildable, they get snatched up, and, and if it's a ten or fifteen thousand dollar, and I may be way out and you know, out in the un out in the stars with this, but if it's a ten thousand uh, dollar demo bill, and we attach it to taxes, and the taxes are say two thousand dollars or something, and so that's a twelve or thirteen thousand dollar bill. Somebody's going to step up and get into a bidding war, and they're going to take that lot legally through the county, and then they're going to build a house, put something on it. Well, the problem with that lot is it's only 3,700 square feet. That's below our minimum uh, building size. So what could somebody do with that? It's an existing lot. It is, for lack of a better word, grandfathered. So someone could as long as they stay within the setbacks. We just have a few of those types of lots that are left and... This one happened to have a structure on it, and eventually probably will be buildable. Oh, is, was something done to avoid the demolition order from November 2020? I don't, I'm not sure why we're making this decision again. It was all with notice, and we had people that were living there. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that we had all the notice covered uh, before that one. We would send we would send documents, uh, certified mail, like our ordinance says, and it would go to the go to the post office and then re be returned. Uh, they would attempt to make service, but the people that were residing in this residence, even though we were, they were related to the owner, refused to accept any mail or open any mail on behalf of that person because they didn't. It, it, it's unresolved thinking, but they didn't want to get in trouble for opening mail. They didn't want it to be a federal offense, is what they said. So they just let mail pile up or go unclaimed and uh, continue to live there. And so it was a situation that in our attempts to make proper notice and, and make them aware, and I think we really as a city went above and beyond in our efforts to keep them apprised of what was going on and, and really work with them. Uh, and in the final analysis, as this, this appears to be coming to a conclusion, it's nice to know that those people are relocated and they're you would be appalled to see the inside of this and walk through it. And you can't walk through it without either wearing coveralls or dousing yourself with flea and tick aerosols because uh, you walk through there and they just jump on you. And so you, it's, uh, it's uninhabitable. It's unfit for human uh, habitation. And uh, you know, people were living there, and that's sad. It's really sad in a city such as this. It's sad anywhere. But uh, I think we did did all we could to put them on, uh, I guess, the path to uh, getting straightened out. But notice was our biggest problem because they wouldn't accept any notice. So I guess that's my biggest concern is that with all the legal proceedings going on with this property and not being in foreclosure yet, still trying to get it probated out for lack of a will and everything. Is there anything that can come back and bite us if we decide to go ahead and uh, demolish that property? I believe that we've given proper notice to, to everyone okay. uh, that, that needs to be. So, uh, you know, I, I think we're in good shape. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I would think also that 
we would need to take it down in the interest of public safety for the community at large and to uh, avoid the possibility of anybody inhabiting the property. The condition, current condition of the property is well documented. If in case somebody comes back later and says you've destroyed my property, I don't think, I think there's very little risk there, even if we turned out to be wrong, because the property, the improvements that are there are not worth anything. We've probably improved the, the, the value of the property by demolishing the structure that's there. And that's very well documented at this point. So. Can I speak on one more point? As I've explained to the family of uh, Mr. Johnson, the property is still theirs, and until it goes to foreclosure, until it's probated or something like that, the city is not taking the property away. They're taking away the da dangerous structure. They still have an opportunity, even after tonight, to make remedy to the situation that the house is in or the property is in, and they've been given that advice. I don't know that they're going to act on it, but they still have an opportunity to recover whatever they can recover in the sale of that property, satisfy the liens, and walk away with some money. I don't know what that looks like, but the city is not taking away the property. This this action, whatever it is, does not remove their their property rights. If if I'm yes, sir. I would think, if anything, this action would be improving the value of the property. Do we need to add a timeline to the motion, like we've done in the previous ones, like 30 days, which I believe is the minimum? Uh, you're required by law to wait for 30 days anyway just to give them 30 days uh, a, a opportunity to appeal to district court. So I don't know that it needs to be added to this. Any further discussion? Having none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, nay. I mean, nay. Aye. Yeah, I, I haven't talked to them all. Was that everybody? <laughs> Any opposed, nay. Having all passes unanimously. All right. Uh, oh. Next is uh, item eight, consent agenda. Items A through D, council, any items want to be pulled? Having none, uh, any objection to consent agenda? All right, consent agenda is accepted as is. Item nine, new business discussion, possible action may be taken on the following items. And I would like to remove, or I'm gonna remove item B from tonight's agenda. So with that, item A, presentation of fiscal, fiscal year 2020 audit performed by Belt Harris Paycheck LLLP, Mr. Spear. And I know Stephanie's here. Yes, um, again, uh, Stephanie Harris is here to uh, present the uh, 2020 financial report. I believe you have a hard copy. And in front of you that's bound. She's here to present and answer any questions. Welcome, Stephanie. <laughs> Council very pleased to say that we are issuing a clean, unmodified opinion on the city's financial statements. Unmodified being the highest level of assurance we can provide as the independent auditor that the financial statements are materially correct and that all disclosures required by generally accepted accounting principles were included. 
Page 15 of that report includes a statement in that position at September 30th, 2020 for the city. This particular presentation is full accrual, simply meaning that we have accounted for all of the city's long-term assets, which are your capital assets, as well as your long-term liabilities. At the end of the 2020 fiscal year, the city ended the year with approximately 15.1 million in total assets. This did represent an increase in the city's capital assets. You had an overall ending liability balance of just over 1,070,000, leaving you with a positive overall ending net position of 14,075,000. The majority of that which represents the city's investment in long-term capital assets of approximately 9.1 million. Turning the page to 16 and 17 is a sideways presentation of a traditional income statement. This is also full accrual. So it includes things like depreciation expense. For the 2020 fiscal year, the city incurred just over 2.8 million in total expenses to provide all municipal services. The city collected direct charges for services of just over 590,000, as well as operating grants and contributions of 459,000. If you were to look at this side by side uh, against the 2019 fiscal year, you would see that the city had a substantial reduction in charges for services. This is primarily related to municipal court uh, and the impacts of COVID-19. However, much of that in reduction was offset by grants and contributions in the form of a capital contribution from the EDC. The city had a net expense for the year of uh, just over 1.7 million. You collected total general revenues of just over 2.3 million, the bulk of which represents sales tax dollars. Over on page 22 and 23, this is the statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. This is modified accrual or the basis by which you annually review and adopt the operating budget. Uh, total revenues for the 2020 fiscal year were at just over 3.1 million. Total expenditures, which did include uh, capital outlay, were just over 2.7 million. After some interfund transfers, you had an overall positive increase in fund balance of 474,000, uh, the majority of which could be seen in roads and drainage as well as the general fund. Uh, the general fund ended the year with a ending fund balance of 4.1 million. Again, one of the financial indicators, uh, a strength would be how much ending fund balance is held within the city's general fund in comparison to your operating expenditures. You generally want to see an unassigned fund balance of at least 25%. And if you look at page 18, you'll note that the general fund ended the 2020 fiscal year with just over 2 million in unassigned fund balance. And this represented approximately 78% of your 2020 expenditures. In addition, your overall ending fund balance at 4.1 million was at 159% of your 2020 expenditures. So even with your reduction that you saw in the charges for services, uh, the city ended the year in a very healthy position. That concludes my remarks. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Easy for you to say. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate it. And Cheryl, I know you do a lot of work back there taking care of and getting all these numbers. So thanks for that. I, I believe we can get that posted to the website as an electronic document as well. Okay. Uh, next is uh, item C, approved waterfront bid results and transfer waterfront. C-082A and C-082B to the appropriate winning bidders. Uh, Did you remove A or B or D? I removed B. I removed B. Okay, I'm sorry. I heard D. My bad. I heard, I heard yeah. D. B is in Bravo. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry to interrupt. C-082A to Steve Wordis and C-082B to Kenneth Sheeler. And uh, these bids went out and uh, had opening bids, and I think one was uh, turned down in order for Mr. Sheeler to get one, and then a uh, second bidder won on the uh, 82A. All motion to approve uh, the waterfront bids as written. I'll second it. Motion by Mr. Scanlon and second by Ms. Leday. 
Any discussion? Having none, all in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed, nay. Having none, motion passes. Item D, Delta. Appoint one volunteer to serve on Parks and Pool Committee to fill vacancy left by Pamela House. Resignation term expires 9-30-2021. Mr. Speer. Uh, good evening. This is to fill a spot on uh, Park and Pool Committee. Uh, the chair, Chris Richardson, is here. I think she'd like to just speak and give you her recommendation. I've been in contact with her and, and uh, would support her recommendation as well. Uh, we have two well-qualified uh, candidates. I do agree that both are qualified, but our preference would be for Laura Broussard. She's very attentive to, she's very attentive to various issues relating to our committee and has informed us on several occasions to issues that needed addressing, especially at the pool. And we feel she has an interest and passion in volunteering and would be an asset in helping us accomplish our goal. Thank you, Mrs. Ms. Richardson. Thank you. We have a motion. I'd like to make a motion to appoint Laura Broussard uh, to the uh, volunteer position on the Parks and Pool Committee to fill the vacancy left by Pamela House. I'll second. All right, motion for Ms. Laura Broussard by Mr. Fisher, second by Mr. Cronister. Any discussion? Having none, all in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay. Having none, motion passes. Uh, item number 10, discussion only, item A, roads and drainage ordinance review. <laughs> well, you, you can strike it. <laughs> no, we can we'll take this opportunity. Um, we met twice last month in roads and drainage. Um, couple hours both times and I took took um, the feedback we got from the public it was in June uh, we made some modifications to the proposed ordinance and we were fortunate that Steve and Monica attended last week to maybe get a little more information um, than they'd had before on it so um, we've, we've got an open meeting here so we've got an opportunity if you've got any questions or want to discuss um, before I send this to Brent to go back through legal and get it on the agenda for the September meeting. Is there a 30,000 foot level you can give us of what the issues were con concerns of the residents and how you address them? Sure. Um, there was seven big, big issues uh, that were brought up by the residents. Number one was gutters. Uh, we retracted some of the requirements on gutters to require them only on eaves within 10 feet of a property line rather than universally on every home. So if you're really close to your neighbors, you got to have gutters. You don't have to have them on the front of your house or the back of your house. We thought that was a, a nice middle ground. Uh, we adjusted the topo survey requirements to only extend five feet into the, the adjacent properties and have a seven foot grid rather than 10 and five foot. Um, and we excluded any adjacent properties explicitly uh, or ex adjacent structures that fell within that five foot range. I think that kind of went without saying, but we, we added it in there because it was a concern. So now it's, you know, it's, it's very explicit. Um, we changed some language such as the city designated reviewing registered professional engineer to just say city engineer, cleaned up the ordinances some in that regard to make, make them more readable um, let's see what else. And then we get to the big ticket items. Um, I'll start with excessive fill. We we had an issue where excessive fill existed in the ordinances before, and it wasn't defined. It just said excessive fill. Well, that could mean anything. So we discussed and came up with what we thought was a reasonable amount of fill that generally will work with the style of homes built in the community over the last 20 years, and that that's been been added in there. Um, 
and then let's see um, we can talk about should we do bulkheads or the the engineer review next <laughs> um, the we'll, we'll do bulkheads um, bulkheads we orig originally said no no more bulkheads period um, we step back from that and we're the, the ordinance is the ordinance as written allows them basically anywhere that you can build a house on the build lines or closer into the center of the property uh, that prevents a giant wall from getting built next to a neighbor but it still allows the property owner a lot of flexibility in how to you know, resolve their property how, how they want to design it gives them some freedom there um, obviously it makes it more difficult on the narrower properties but uh, that's that's what we arrived on is it possible to refer those retaining walls instead of bulkheads? We we have it defined as um, a retaining wall, a slab, any structure that causes a, a sharp change in elevation. So there's a a reasonably flexible definition of that. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, we we followed in the the next two items we took directly out of the Spring Valley Village, Texas drainage criteria manual. Changed the city name from. Spring Valley Village to Clear Lake Shores, um, and that, that's essentially all, all we did. We just adopted those two sections. They were uh, addressing elevation change along the property lines, uh, and that line essentially says you have a two-foot buffer around your property where you cannot change the elevation within two feet of the side edge of your property um, in a way which could become a physical barrier for the natural flow of water um, from adjacent properties. And that's um, that's a pretty common piece of language that's in most drainage manuals. Um, so we, we adopted it here. And then we added a section that is far too long to read. Um, I But I uh, definitely think this will be available um, for public consumption all month. Um, it was from Spring Valley Village, and that is uh, prior to certificate, sorry, a certificate of occupancy being issued, there's a standard letter that the that an engineer doesn't have to be the design engineer or the city's engineer but an engineer must basically take this form letter and sign it stating that he has inspected the drainage as installed uh, has some stipulations um, what exactly what that means and that it is installed and working as designed so there will be a level of responsibility that they will accept um, in conjunction with our building official inspecting a property before a CO is issued, um, and that you know, that that helps uh, from the city saying yes, it's good when really it's not. Um, so Kevin was very supportive of that uh, in the meeting, and this is text again straight from Spring Valley Village, Texas. So that's um, that's the the quick and dirty of what we discussed. Uh, I have sent the redlined version of the ordinance, the one from June, out uh, to mayor and everyone on council. Did I send it to you, Rick? I don't remember. I tried to blind copy everyone on it. No. So that's it, it's going to remain unchanged from those red lines um, when I send it to Brent. So you all have it to review. Uh, I've had a couple people ask me for it. I think I'm going to share share that document. Um, it's, you know, it's the, the current can, version. We can put it on the website. That, that's fine. Make um, it easier. When I'll send it to Brent, and then whatever format you want to you know, put on the website is, is okay with me. Yep. And that's, that's all I have for it. I've um, got it pretty well memorized now. So you know, if you've got a specific question, <laughs> feel free to reach out, um, and I'll talk to you about it. Any uh, further discussion on roads and drainage item A? Uh, just let folks know that we mistakenly left off some of the reports for uh, EDC and Civic Club, and I think they're here to make some reports, so we can't do it underneath this meeting. So we're going to officially adjourn at uh, 724, but please stick around for those folks to, to make those announcements. Uh, and don't forget, we don't have a meeting, the second part, and that's where they would normally make those announcements. So meeting's adjourned.